first we bit of power is the word evidence. Evidence can mean different things to different people, but I think in this context we're talking about evidence produced through the robust process of, of science, broadly defined, and that's from the social sciences. Because in the end, that kind of evidence is the only way we have, we have to have relatively reliable information about the world within us and about us. And it's by using that evidence to inform complex decisions by policy makers that we give them a range of options and the evidence allows them to choose better between those options for better effect for the population they're serving. I think there's multiple misconceptions, but I think the scientists have the misconception that science alone makes policy. And of course, that's not the case. There are many other things that come into policy making. And the policy makers think sometimes that just surveying the literature without expert input is sufficient. And those two misconceptions can lead to, uh, I think, a lot of problems at this interface. The scientists make the mistake of thinking of, of taking an arrogant approach. They think that science does give all the answers too often, and they fail to understand the complexity of the trade-offs that must be made, and that, they, that policy makers are not always ready for the science that they have, and the scientists are often not ready for, this, for the, the needs of the policy makers. Three components. First, they must be have integrity about the science. That is, they must fairly describe the science they know, the science that they don't know, and the caveats that surround the limits of that knowledge. Secondly, they must do it with humility and honesty. And thirdly, they must do it in a way that engenders trust of the policymaker, the public, politician and the rest of the science community. I think we need to explain what science can do and what science cannot do. I'm convinced that if we take an approach which is one of describing the processes of science, the acknowledge the limits of science, acknowledge the many other considerations that go into societal decision making, and focus on those elements rather than just pushing more and more detailed knowledge at people, we can actually maintain the trust, the respect of both the policy maker and the public because that interaction between the policy maker and the public is critical to societal decision making. Honesty. Honesty is needed. We need to be clear about what we know, recognize that there are always gaps in our knowledge, recognize that that knowledge has variance around it, and I've never found a policy maker that cannot deal with uncertainty. They live with uncertainty all the time. They know there's going to be unexpected or anticipated spillover positive and negative benefits of any decision they make, and I think they distrust scientists when we're over, over dogmatic and over precise about what are clearly complex matters. I think that's very difficult. Uh, ultimately, it, it is a subjective assessment of whether the ultimate policies are compatible with the available evidence of the time. Often, much policy advice from the science community is about not doing something as much as it is about doing things. And that's why it's so difficult to formally assess it. I think any scientist must read about the policy uh, framework. They, uh, too many scientists don't understand enough about how policy works. I think Paul Kenny's recent book on the policy, on the politics of evidence-based policy making is an excellent primer on that subject. I think I've written a lot on my website about uh, the humility of science and the humility of science and science advising, 
how we act in a post-trust world. I think those two, and obviously I'm biased by what I've written myself, but I think they're good starting points. Well, that depends partly on, the, on whether we're talking about a national government, a confederation of governments like in the European Union, or whether we're talking about a sub-regional and urban government. But if I stick to national governments, I think we've got to understand that there are people outside the policy system, like academy professional bodies, who are well positioned to integrate and provide what I call formal advice, advice on a specific matter that's been deliberatively Develop. But equally, there are people within the system, people like science advisors, people like scientists within agencies or ministries, who have a slightly different role. They're not only a conduit to the more formal sources of advice, we also have a part in that brainstorming, the evaluation of the different options that exist. And I think any complete scientific advisory system needs a good, robust scientific community of academics. It needs academies and professional bodies that uh, are well experienced in writing deliberative reports. And it needs people within the system linked to the executive of whatever government arrangement is there. And those three groups need to be able to both be independent of each other, but at the same time communicate.